Shalom from Jerusalem, the city of peace, yet probably the most appropriate place on planet Earth to speak about wars since this city had been destroyed 16 times and yet according to Bible prophecy will be the scene of the last and the final battle. The question that everybody's asking is, how come so many people all around the world are rising up to destroy this country and the people of Israel for no apparent reason ever since dawn of history. I believe that the answer is not anywhere else but in the Bible itself. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 83 is giving, in my opinion, the answer for all of these questions. The Bible says in Psalm 83, do not keep silent, O God, do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. The enemies of God and those who hate God are apt to do something, yet they cannot fight the living God, the God of Israel. Therefore, they have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. And they have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. And so we can see that the battle is between the enemies of God and those who hate God. And in their attempt to fight God, they come up against His people, His sheltered ones. Israel. And their obvious goal is to cut the name of Israel off so it will be remembered no more. Many people all over the world are asking themselves, what is the origin of the name Palestine and how come we are having a name that is not in the Bible and not in any history book from before 2,000 years ago? The answer is going all the way back to the end of the second Jewish revolt against the Romans, when Caesar Adrian decided to put an end to the Jewish people, that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. And he decided to do two things. He decided to level the city here that is behind me and to build on top a pagan Roman city which he named Aelia Capitolina. And at the same time, Caesar Adrian decided to name this entire country after their old foes from the Old Testament, the Philistines, and change its name to Syria Palestina, the province of Syria in Palestine. And that is when the name Palestine was first born into this world. Yet the name Palestine stuck to this place and ever since 135 AD, any person that lived here was called Palestinian. Jew or Arab, Christian or any other religion, they were all called Palestinians. The name Palestinian cannot be taken and owned by any group of people. This is not a name of a nation. This is not a name of a sovereign state. It is a name of a region and a name that was given for one reason and one cause, and that is that the name of Israel will be remembered no more, just as Psalm 83 had said. When we come to deal with the modern history of the wars of Israel, we have to go back to the end of World War I. The Ottoman Empire, the empire that ruled this region for about 400 years, from 1517 to 1917, was coming to its end. The Ottoman Empire was about to lose that war, and Britain, France, and Russia gathered together to somehow find a solution for what's going to be in the day after. However, in 1917, the communist revolution in Russia 
left Russia outside of the game, and now it is only Britain and France. Sir Mark Sykes and Francois Georges Picot were diplomats, British and French respectively, drew up in 1916 a secret treaty agreeing how Britain and France will carve up the remains of the Ottoman Empire, which they were absolutely confident that will be defeated by the end of that First World War. When this happened, the League of Nations gave Britain and France a mandate to run the countries we know now as Syria and Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan and Iraq as part of their empires while creating independent countries. On November 2nd, 1917, the United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary, Sir Arthur James Balfour, sent to Baron Rothschild a letter that was supposed to be transmitted to the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. In that letter, he writes, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object in being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James Balfour. The Balfour Declaration was a milestone in the history of the Jewish people and their quest for a homeland here in the land of Israel. For the first time, the empire that controls this part of the world acknowledges the rights of the Jewish people for their homeland. It is a very unusual thing because most of the sympathy that the Jewish people received was only after six million were murdered by Nazi Germany. By 1917, the Brits understood that it is about time for the Jewish people to have their homeland in the land of Israel. Second World War. The invasion of Poland by Germany and subsequent declarations of war on Germany by France and the United Kingdom marked the beginning of one of the darkest eras in our history. From late 1939 to early 1941, in a series of campaigns and treaties, Germany conquered or controlled much of continental Europe and formed the Axis alliance with Italy and Japan. Following the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Germany and the Soviet Union partitioned and annexed territories of their European neighbors, including Poland, Finland and the Baltic states. The United Kingdom and the British Commonwealth were the only Allied forces continuing the fight against the Axis with campaigns in North Africa and the Horn of Africa, as well as the long-running Battle of the Atlantic. In June 1941, the European Axis powers launched an invasion of the Soviet Union, opening the largest land theater of war in history which trapped the major parts of the Axis military forces into a war of attrition. The Axis advance halted in 1942 when Japan lost the critical Battle of Midway near Hawaii and Germany was defeated in North Africa and then decisively at Stalingrad in the Soviet Union. In 1943, with a series of German defeats on the Eastern Front, the Allied invasion of Italy, which brought about Italian surrender, and Allied victories in the Pacific, the Axis lost the initiative and undertook strategic retreat on all fronts. In 1944, 
The Western Allies invaded France, while the Soviet Union regained all the territorial losses and invaded Germany and its allies. The war in Europe ended with an invasion of Germany by the Western Allies and the Soviet Union, culminating in the capture of Berlin by Soviet and Polish troops and the subsequent German unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. Numerous times along the history prior to the establishment of the sovereign state of Israel, there were attempts to bring about a lasting, comprehensive peace between the Jewish people and the Arabs. One must wonder how come up until today, not only that a peace like that is not around, but the hatred towards Israel is growing bigger and stronger. Fundamental Muslims believe that it is the will of Allah for Islam to rule the world. For them, Islamic law stipulates that to fulfill Muhammad's task, every infidel domain must be considered a territory of war. Maurice Farhi, an author that was born in Turkey, a Muslim who lives in Britain right now, and serves as the Vice President of PEN, the British Council of Authors, wrote in his book, The Last of Days, that Muslims believe there can be no peace with Jews, Christians, or any non-Muslims, and that if peace must be made, then only a truce is permissible, and that for a maximum of 10 years, as an expedient to hone our sword, wet our blood, and strengthen our will. Fundamentalist Muslims must destroy the Jewish people and rule this country or Muhammad is a false prophet and the Quran is not true. And such thought is inconceivable. So that the Muslims must attack Israel in order to be loyal to their own prophet. Now this is not the position of all Muslims around the world, but it is the position of the fundamentalists and the jihadists and unfortunately, up until today, their voice overtakes all the others. One would think that siding with the Arabs would cause the Arabs to side with the British throughout that war. Yet it was not the case. The Jewish population volunteered to the British army to fight against Nazi Germany throughout World War II. Yet the Arabs who lived here in the land of Israel called then Palestine, sided and even more so collaborated with Nazi Germany. The Mufti of the Arabs here in the land, Hajj Amin El Husseini, flew all the way to Berlin to meet with Adolf Hitler and signed a treaty with him that will basically bring an end to the Jewish existence in Palestine once Germany will win the war. It is quite inconceivable to think that those who collaborate with the Nazis were benefiting from the British policy, whereas those who sided with the British were actually suffering more and more. Right when World War II started, the British mandate caved in to the Arab demand for an independent state. In 1939, the Brits published the White Paper that called for an establishment of an independent Arab state within the next 10 years and limited the Jewish immigration to the land for the next five years to 75,000 only. After which it will have to cease whatsoever. Such thought affected the lives of many people throughout the Holocaust as the gates into Palestine, the land of Israel, the homeland of the Jews, were closed for the Jewish people who are about to flee from the horrors of the Nazis. Once again, the Arabs rejected a very generous proposal and it really fits what our first foreign minister, Abba Ibn, once said that the Palestinians never missed an opportunity 
to miss an opportunity. The Jewish people that survived the Holocaust were hoping to come to a land where they can find finally peace. Peace where they can bring up their children, peace where they can live their lives quietly, where they can prosper, not instead, but next to their neighbors. Unfortunately, that quest for peace that was expressed in so many songs and so many stories written by Jewish authors and poets was met with something completely different on the other side. The attempt to destroy Israel and the people of Israel had absolutely nothing to do with any occupied territories in 1947 and 48. By then, Israel still did not have the West Bank, Gaza, the Golan Heights, or any other of these controversial places that are claimed to be the reason for this recent conflict. The Bible said in Psalm 120, Woe is me that I dwell in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And indeed, when the British efforts to bring about peace to the land of Israel, to Palestine of those days, came to a deadlock, to a dead end, they decided that it's about time to pass the baton to the United Nations. In 1946, the United Nations started an effort to bring about, finally, a solution where there will be two states for two people, Israel for the Jews and Palestine for the Arabs. By November 29, 1947, a plan was drafted by the UN Commission for Palestine, and that plan was known as the Partition Plan. The plan was basically dividing the entire land between Jews and Arabs, leaving Jerusalem as an international place. That plan, which left two-thirds of the land which was desolated and desert in the hands of the Jews and the most fertile area, the Galilee, in the hands of the Arabs, was embraced by the Jews and rejected by the Arabs. Once again, the Arabs missed an opportunity for a very generous offer given to them not only by the Brits, but this time by the entire United Nations. The Brits decided that on the eve between May 14 and May 15, 1948, they are going to lower the Union Jack flag and to leave whatsoever the Middle East to find its own solution by itself. On that day, Friday, May 14, 1948, the leader of the Jewish community in the land of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, summoned all the other leaders from all different fractions and parties to the museum in Tel Aviv, since Jerusalem was besieged. And over there, he read the Declaration of Independence of Israel. That declaration was basically bringing back the old and biblical and God-given name of this land and this country back to its place. David Ben-Gurion said, I hereby declare the establishment of the state of the Jews, which will be called the State of Israel. If you remember, Psalm 83 says that our enemies are up to cut us off from being a nation, that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. The return of the name back to its land 
and the return of the people back to their land was the main reason for the outbreak of the War of Independence. We only had few hours to rejoice and dance in the streets before five Arab countries would invade into the land of Israel, the newborn state, and pose an existential threat to the people and the land. David Ben-Gurion literally had few hours to decide between two options, a bad one and even worse one. The bad option is to declare statehood and suffer an imminent war. The worst one is not to declare statehood and suffer an imminent war. David Ben-Gurion decided that although I have few hours, a nation must be born. And that, of course, brought life to the words of the prophet Isaiah in its 66th chapter, where he says, Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery? says the Lord. Shall I, who caused delivery, shut up the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All you who love her, rejoice for you with her, all you who mourn for her. A nation was born at once. A nation was born within one day. A nation that is now having not only a flag and a national anthem, but also a sovereign and an independent state. The words of the prophet Isaiah rings in the ears of so many people up until today. Finally, Zion gave birth to a land and children that are comprising together the newborn state of Israel. Violence in the Holy Land broke out almost immediately after the United Nations announced partition on November 29, 1947. In the first phase of the war, lasting from November 29, 1947 until April 1, 1948, the Palestinian Arabs took the offensive with help from volunteers from neighboring countries. The Jews suffered severe casualties and passage along most of their major roadways were disrupted. Even as Israel declared its statehood on May 14, 1948, five mechanized Arab armies invaded. The Jews had only 35,000 fighting men, no air force except for a small training plane out of which the pilot dropped a grenade, and only six tanks. The Egyptian army alone had 40,000 soldiers, 135 tanks, heavy guns, and an air force of over 60 planes, including Spitfires and bombers. The Jordanians had the Arab Legion, which trained by the British and led by an Englishman, Sir John Bagot Glubb, along with 48 British officers. Yet against all odds, the Jewish fighters won. Many of the pitched battles became epic, and smacked of the miraculous. For example, the Egyptian army launched an attack along the Mediterranean coast against the kibbutz Yad Mordechai on May 19, 1948, as part of the offensive to take Tel Aviv. Two infantry battalions, one armored battalion and one artillery battalion, expected to take the kibbutz of 130 residents in three hours. The battle raged for days. The Jewish defenders held off the entire Egyptian army much longer than anyone expected, using homemade weapons that many times did nothing more than make noise. 
They even used mock soldiers made out of wood, which they moved from trench to trench in order to give the appearance of greater numbers. Although the Egyptians eventually broke through, they were now days behind schedule and their morale was badly shaken. The Jordanians, meanwhile, had a very strong grip of the old city of Jerusalem. Three times the Israelis tried attacking at a point called Latrun, but were unsuccessful. The road between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv remained cut. Jerusalem would have succumbed to siege if not for the discovery of an ancient Roman road that turned south of the city and then turned west until it turned north. A great deal of this road was constructed by religious Jews from Mea Shearim in the dead of night to avoid Arab snipers. The final road was bumpy and laden with holes, but it was a road. It enabled trucks to come into Jerusalem and effectively break the siege. The result was stalemate around Jerusalem. In the north, the Arabs were encamped at the top of Har Kanan, which overlooks Tzfat. It was virtually impregnable position. The Jews could not gain control of the road to Safed or the city itself as long as they were there. Then the Israelis then brought up the Davidka, a tremendously noisy mortar that was extremely inaccurate and of the little tactical value. One Friday afternoon, the Israelis fired at Davidka several times and then a miracle happened. It rained. Since it never rained in May and June there, the Arabs were now sure that the Jews had an atomic bomb. What else could make it rain? Consequently, they fled their impregnable position on top of Haknan. The Israelis captured Sfat and drove the Arabs out of the entire northern area of Galilee. These are only a few examples. For the believing Jew, there were nothing short of miracles, direct signs of the divine hand in Jewish history. With the war of independence still raging, the war of Israel's survival was just beginning. The ceasefire that was uh, achieved in 1949 did not put an end to the efforts of the Arab countries surrounding Israel to bring an end to what they called the Zionist entity in the heart of the Muslim world. As we talked about before, for the fundamental Muslims, infidel territories must be taken, especially territory that once used to be controlled by Islam and now it's not. The 1950s were the early years of a newborn state that has to deal with several challenges. Challenges of absorption of hundreds of thousands of immigrants, Jewish people that are coming from the four corners of the world back to their homeland. Immigrants that are coming from Arab countries, Northern Africa, immigrants that are coming from Western Europe, Eastern Europe, as well as immigrants coming from North and South America. Israel had to deal with a triple challenge, a challenge to bring them physically to the land, a challenge to teach them the only way to communicate between all of us, the Hebrew language, and a challenge to bring them into full integration with the people that lived here for the past few years. In 1955, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser began to import arms from the Soviet bloc to build his arsenal for the confrontation with Israel. In the short term, however, he employed a new tactic to persecute Egypt's war with Israel. He announced it on August 31, 1955. Egypt has decided to dispatch her heroes, the disciples of Pharaoh and the sons of Islam, and they will cleanse the land of Palestine. There will be no peace on Israel's border because we demand vengeance and vengeance is Israel's death. These heroes, the Fadayim, 
operated mainly from bases in Jordan so that Jordan would bear the burnt of Israel's retaliation, which inevitably followed. The escalation continued with the Egyptian blockade of the Straits of Tehran and Nasser's nationalization of the Suez Canal in July of 1956. On October 14, Nasser made clear his intent. I am not solely fighting against Israel itself. My task is to deliver the Arab world from destruction through Israel's intrigue, which has its roots abroad. Our hatred is very strong. There is no sense in talking about peace with Israel. There is not even the smallest place for negotiations. Less than two weeks later, on October 25, Egypt signed a triptide agreement with Syria and Jordan, placing Nasser in command of all three armies. The continued blockade of the Suez Canal and Gulf of Aqaba to Israeli shipping, combined with the increased Fadayeen attacks, prompted Israel, with the backing of Britain and France, to attack Egypt on October 29, 1956. When the decision was made to go to war in 1956, more than 100,000 soldiers were mobilized in less than 72 hours, and the Air Force was fully operational within 43 hours. Paratroopers landed in the Sinai and Israeli forces quickly advanced unopposed towards the Suez Canal before halting in compliance with the demand of England and France. Though their allies had failed to accomplish their goals, the Israelis were satisfied at having reached theirs in an operation that took only 100 hours. By the end of the fighting, Israel held the Gaza Strip and had advanced as far as Sharm el-Sheikh along the Red Sea. A total of 231 Israeli soldiers died in the fighting. The United States subsequently joined the Soviet Union in a campaign to force Israel to withdraw. This included a threat to discontinue all U.S. assistance, U.N. sanctions, and expulsion from the United Nations. U.S. pressure resulted in an Israeli withdrawal from the areas it conquered without obtaining any concessions from the Egyptians. This sowed the seeds of the 1967 war. The 1960s posed a new threat on a different front line, and this time from the side of the Syrian regime. The Syrians were constantly harassing the Israeli settlements down below the Golan Heights, almost on a daily basis. Generation of children grew up in bomb shelters in that area. It was only inevitable that a confrontation is about to occur. By 1964, a confrontation nearly took place as a result of the Syrian effort to divert the waters of the Dan River into their territories. Israel understood that unless we penetrate into the highest hierarchy of the Syrian regime and military, we would not be able to understand what they are thinking and somehow thwart that threat. And that brings us to the story of Eli Cohen, a young Jew who was born in Alexandria, Egypt and moved to Israel in his 20s. Cohen was recruited to the Israeli Mossad and he's best known for his espionage work between 1961 and 1965. At first, Cohen was sent to Argentina to begin his coverage as a businessman there. Cohen moved to Damascus in February of 1962 under the alias Kamel Amin Tabet, and shortly after developed close relationships with the political and military hierarchy and became the chief advisor of the Syrian minister of defense. After a few days of radio silence imposed by the Syrian counterintelligence authorities, Cohen was uncovered right in the middle of transmitting a message to the Israeli side. Cohen was convicted under pre-war martial laws to death penalty in 1965. The intelligence that Eli Cohen gathered is claimed to have been an important factor in Israel's success 
in the Six Days' War in 1967. 